Hi folks, and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So today we're gonna to be talking about an antivirus driver that had a vulnerability in it, and that vulnerability was actually used by a ransomware group, and they repurposed the driver in order to kill other antivirus. Revert before they delivered their ransomware. So before we get into this, let's just check it out in action so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So here we have a process hacker just showing you what's running. I have ESET installed on the system. ESET was actually the original target of the ransomware group. They were trying to disable ESET. So here we have eKern running. Uh, we try to kill it uh, with administrator privileges and we can't do that. We don't have permissions to because it is a protected process. Then we run this malware script, which invokes the vulnerable driver. And you can see here the process is being killed repeatedly. Uh, you can see it's trying to respawn, but it's being killed in a loop um, and basically nullified by this malicious script. Okay, so how did all this happen? What's going on here? How is this even possible? Let's back up and we'll talk a little bit about how all of this unfolded. So we first became aware of this around December 2021 when someone on our Discord, if you're not on Discord, go check it out. Lots of interesting stuff like this going on on there. Um, I don't really know how to explain Discord on here. I'm sure most of you guys already know what it is, but if you don't, it's kind of like a forum with more organized categories and whatnot. So anyways, um, so, Someone on our Discord posted this malware and asked us to take a look at it. And when we looked at it, we realized, oh shoot, this is actually pretty effective at killing antivirus processes. In fact, it can kill any protective process, even ELAM processes, if you guys are familiar with like the early run anti-malware process, uh, this, this can get rid of those. Uh, so any sort of AV, EDR, et cetera, can be killed by this. And so when we took a look at it, we reached out to the AV company who's responsible for the driver immediately and informed them about that. They actually already knew about this and they've been taking steps to sort of remedy this issue already by the time we reached out to them. And actually I held off on making a video about this because at the time I didn't quite understand how the driver signing protection process worked for Windows. And I wanted to learn more about how that worked. And also I feel like there's some subset of our reverse engineering community that uh, takes shots at antivirus a lot. And I, just, I don't want to be part of that. I, you know, I don't want to put in anything negative, but since uh, December of 2021, there's actually been a few uh, blog articles published on this vulnerability, and there have been some real remediation steps taken in order to make sure that the driver cannot be abused like this in the future. So uh, I decided now is probably the right time to make the video. So the point of this video is not to throw shade on them. It's just to explain the technicalities of how this all works, uh, how it could be abused, or other drivers in the future, and what the process is when you find a vulnerable driver like this. What do you need to do? So without further ado, let's jump in and start taking a look at how all of this works. All right, so I've just pulled up the script in our analysis VM here and opened it up in Sublime so we can take a closer look at it. Now, the nice thing about this malware is it's written in PowerShell, so you can pretty much just read what it's doing. It's not obfuscated at all. So I'll just take you quickly through uh, how it works here. And of course, the most interesting part is actually the driver. So we'll get into that in a minute. So the first two commands here are just to start the driver as a service. Um, so they create it and then start it. And as you can see here, they expect it to be in the uh, Windows directory. Of course, it was moved in there manually by the operator prior to running the script uh, or via another script. So one thing we note right off the bat here is that it has to be running as admin. You can't move files into the Windows directory without running as admin, and you can't start services like this without running as admin. So the attacker has to have admin privileges on the host. So now that they've started it as a service and they can actually access it, there's a little bit of setup in the script here. Most importantly, the process list in this script just includes EKRN, which is the ESET kernel driver, the, the driver that's used for scanning uh, by ESET. So there's only one process in the process list here. This is the targeted process list, which they're going to try to kill processes from. Now there's other versions of this, of course, that have many more processes in that list. We're just taking a look at one of the earlier versions of the script that we saw that has only one process. Next thing they do is they have a little bit of template code here. Those of you who have used PowerShell to interact with the Windows APIs will know what this is. They are just creating PowerShell wrappers for these Windows API calls, create file and device IO control. And of course, 
What they're gonna do with this is they are going to use create file to get a handle to the driver, and then they are going to use the device IO control to actually interact with it. And we can see as I'm highlighting those API names, you can see they're showing up here in the rest of the PowerShell. So let's take a look at that right now. Um, they use create file with a named pipe here. And this is a name pipe, which is used to access the driver. So they create a handle to that named pipe, and then they call an ioctal using device IO control. And then they use create file to access another named pipe here and create a handle to it, which they save as H. Then they have this little while loop here. They loop through the loop a thousand times each time through the loop. For each entry in the process list here, they call get process name with the name from the process list. So they're just calling get process name to get a handle to uh, the process EKRN. And then once they have that handle, they actually get the process ID and they pass the process ID to another device IO control command for this IOCTL with the handle that they had previously opened to the named pipe. Those of you who are not familiar with user LAN interaction with drivers, this is how it works. You open a handle to a named pipe, which allows you to communicate with the driver, and then you use your ioctals. So each one of these ioctals will be a function in the driver that you can call from user land. So what we'll do next is we will open up the driver in Ida, and we'll take a look for these ioctals and try and figure out what they are. And actually, just one thing before we open up that driver in Ida, let me just show you, uh, so there's no magic on my sleeve, I will show you a sig check dash a on our driver here. So you can see that it is in fact signed and it was signed in early 2021. So I'm just doing that to show you that this is a valid signed driver and that is why it was actually able to be used uh, by this script. So let's open that up in Ida now. Okay, so we've opened the driver in Ida and now what we wanna do is hunt for those IO control codes or ioctals. So let's hunt for this guy right here. All right, we have one match. Let's take a look at this code. I'll go to the pseudocode view because it'll be a bit easier to see what's going on here. All right, you can see this is actually in decimal what we needed in hex, so I'll press H. There we go. So now we can see that this is actually a big case statement and you can see that it's handling all of the, the different ioctals. And of course, this is the one that we care about right now. And so what it does when you call it is it actually calls this function here. So let's give this a function. So this is, and we'll give it the control code here. All right, let's see what this actually does. It's taking in an argument here, setting the argument to v7. v7 is clearly a little struct here for ZW open process. We can look up this API and figure out what that struct is. So it's gonna be a P client ID, which of course is just a pointer to a client ID. And we know the client ID is just the process ID and the thread ID. So what we can do is we can create a local type here, view, subview, local types, right click, insert, paste in our client ID struct. All right, so we just edit the uh, void pointers to be D words. I uh, don't know why the void pointer wasn't working here. Okay, and then we can change the actual type here. So Y, turn it into a client ID for our client ID. There we go. That's gonna fix this up a little bit, right? So after fixing that up, we know that arg1 is going to be the process ID. Okay, so looking at this, we can now tell that Whatever process ID is being passed to the IOCTO call, they're actually opening a handle to that process. So this is gonna be a handle. And then they are going to terminate the process. And that's pretty much all this IOCTO does. So you can see this is very simple, very straightforward. All you need to do to terminate a process using this driver is just call that IOCTO and pass it the PID of the process that you want to terminate. Now, because this is a kernel driver running with high permissions, it's able to terminate 
any of these uh, antivirus or EDR processes. So in a nutshell, that was a vulnerability, the fact that any user land process can call this, there's no restrictions on it. And of course, uh, because of that, you've just been given a incredibly powerful tool where you can kill any protected process as long as you have admin rights. So that was the vulnerability that's being exploited. It's very straightforward, very easy to see. And of course, the only tricky part was to track the ioctal from the call and identify where it was actually being used here in the driver, right here. So you can see there's many other IACTLs here that can do other stuff. Uh, we haven't investigated those too much. Like I said, this driver is now not able to be loaded on a fully patched up-to-date Windows 10 and Windows 11 hosts. So it's now no longer very useful. However, there's other vulnerabilities if you guys look closely at some of the other IACTLs. I'll leave that up to you guys to take a look at. And the fix that was put in place was to remove the ability to call these from a user land process directly. There's some additional filtering that was added in the patch version of the driver. I'm not gonna cover that in this video. Again, this video is more about just triaging the vulnerability and the malware that was taking advantage of that vulnerability. So in a nutshell, that's basically how it works. And you can see here, even though this is a driver, it's running in the kernel, it's actually very easy to reverse engineer statically. There's no obfuscation or anything like that. This is a non-malicious driver. It wasn't intended to be used maliciously. So it's very easy to read the code statically and figure out what's going on. Okay, so now that we understand the technical details behind the vulnerability and how it was actually abused by this ransomware group, let's take a look at the process that unfolded after the driver was identified as vulnerable. So there's a few blog articles on this, as I mentioned before. There's a nice rundown from Mandiant published on February 23rd, where they describe their tracking of the Cuba ransomware group, which they refer to as UNC2596 or UNC2596. So that's the group that they're tracking as deploying Cuba ransomware. And in this blog, they talk a little bit about the tools that are used to deploy the ransomware. And one of the tools they name, this is their internal name, is Burnt Cigar. Very nice pun there on Cuba ransomware. So Burnt Cigar is actually just a version of this process killer that we just looked at. And it uses the same vulnerable driver, except the difference is in this case, it has a whole list of processes that it's trying to kill, not just ESET. So there's a whole list of different antivirus, EDR, that the ransomware group terminates before they deploy their ransomware. So this was published, like I said, in February of 2022. And then just after that blog post on February 26th, there was another blog post from Aeon, which basically described the same tooling, the same tool set, same vulnerable driver, and tied it into a specific ransomware engagement and incident response engagement that they were engaged in in December, 2021. So as those two posts came out, good recap of not only the tooling that we're describing here with the vulnerable driver, but also the ransomware and the overall kill chain that was involved in deploying the ransomware. Now fast forward to May of 2022 and Trend Micro releases a blog post, which is again, just running through the same tool set, the same deployment methods, except this time for ransomware called Avos Locker. So the same exact tool suite is being used, but for Avos Locker. And what's interesting about this blog post is Trend actually reached out to the antivirus company whose driver was being used and got a comment from them. So I'm just gonna quickly read that comment for you guys here. So this is from the AV company whose driver was being used. They say, we can confirm the vulnerability is an old version of our driver, which we fixed in our release in June, 2021. We also work closely with Microsoft so that they released a block in the Windows operating system, 10 and 11 only. So the old version of the driver can't be loaded into memory. So that sounds like a good response, but we get a little bit more detail. The update from Microsoft for Windows operating system was published in February as an optional update. So this was not required. This was not pushed out to all systems. It was just optional, which explains why the driver continued to be used by other ransomware groups after it had already been reported. And then Microsoft continues that a security release was released in April of 2022 so that 
fully updated machines running Windows 10 and 11 are not vulnerable. So to recap, they released an optional update in February for everybody who opted into that update. And then they released a security release for all machines 10 and 11 in April. So everybody should be patched against it. So that's the timeline in June 2021. This is reported to the antivirus company. They released their own internal patch. They fixed the driver, I guess, report it to Microsoft. It's unclear when they reported to Microsoft, whether it was right away or whether it was later in February, because the vulnerable driver continued to be used by the Cuba ransomware operators up until at least December of 2021, at which point it was reported again. We became aware of it on our Discord. We reported the driver to Microsoft at this point using Microsoft's vulnerable and malicious driver reporting tool. I highly encourage you guys to report drivers via this service if you come across one. And we also reported it again to the AV company who had created the driver, and they said that they were already aware of it. So this happened around the December timeframe. And then in February, Microsoft released a optional update that would prevent the driver from loading. In that timeframe somewhere, Avos Locker began to use the driver. And then in April, Microsoft released an update to all systems blocking the driver from being loaded. So that's the time frame in a nutshell. It's still a little bit unclear about when exactly things were reported to Microsoft, but that's basically the timeline as best as I understand it. Now, the part that I didn't quite understand when we first looked at this driver is of course, drivers have to be signed in order to be loaded. And that's the whole point of why this driver is so powerful. It is signed so you can actually use it. Now, what I didn't quite understand is why you wouldn't just revoke the certificate for the driver, but it turns out it doesn't work that way. It turns out that once you've signed a driver, it's good to go. There is no certificate revocation list per se for drivers. What? Instead, the way it works is Microsoft will actually block these drivers once it becomes aware of them being vulnerable or used maliciously. So what does that mean? That means that the best way to prevent this sort of activity is to use the Microsoft vulnerable and malicious driver reporting service. So it's really simple. All you do is just upload the file to them and let them know what you think it is, if it's vulnerable or if it's malware, and they will do the rest of it. Now, again, it's unclear whether this was actually what was responsible for their initial release in February or whether it was the AV company reporting it to them or both. But this is the only weapon that we have now to prevent signed vulnerable drivers from being reused. Until they go onto the Microsoft block list, the cert is never revoked. I mean, of course, you could revoke the signing certificate, but that would revoke it for all drivers. So that's that's not great. So that's it for this. I hope you found it interesting and informative, most importantly. If you like this kind of content, remember to go check out our Patreon, many more reverse engineering tutorials, techniques, live stream recordings, everything is up there on Patreon if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Give us a like and subscribe. Don't even do that. Who cares? Nobody likes anything anymore. Go follow us on Twitch if you like this kind of stuff. We're mostly streaming on Twitch, but we make the occasional YouTube video once in a while. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this. Keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware. Stay curious.